Hi everyone, um, thank you for coming tonight. My name is John Romano, I'm the Municipal Liaison for the Mass Department of Transportation. Um, we are here um, for a public information meeting tonight on the Callahan Tunnel Project. Um, a couple of things, um, just so you know that the meeting is being recorded by NotThemWaterfront.com, Matt Conti, in the back of the room. And we also have uh, an official stenographer here taking um, official meeting uh, minutes and notes uh, of the meeting tonight. Um, we ask that you let us run through the presentation and then any questions you have, um, we'll be glad to take them at the end of the presentation. Um, I just want to acknowledge uh, the staff that we have here, a full complement of staff. Um, the Highway Administrator Frank Tapola is here, and Frank will be uh, kicking off the meeting. And our State Traffic Engineer, Neil Boudreaux, um, Eliza Pottington, who is working with me in the outreach piece of this. And um, we have various staff members throughout the audience. I won't go to all of them, um, but I want to thank them all for being here. We have our consultant. Um, VHB, uh, Don Cook, and Dennis Wright from um, Dewberry, um, and they're here to help us uh, with the presentation and to make, answer any questions if we need be. Um, when the meeting's over, we're happy to stick around for a few minutes and answer any questions. Um, so if it's something you don't want to raise your hand and ask, um, we'll be glad to do that afterwards. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. When you came, when you came in, or maybe after you came in, we have a couple. We actually have two different sign-in sheets. The building actually has a book that needs people to sign in. So even DOT staff and consultants, if you can sign that at some point, um, that um, is a requirement they have when we have community meetings here. And then the uh, the paper sheets next to it are the DOT sign-in sheets. And if you sign in there and you give us your email address, we will um, be pushing out all the information as we get closer to the um, actual closure, we'll be sending out emails with information, so if we have your email address, you will, you will get on that list. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, Nicole Leo from the Mayor's office, um, Maria Popolo from Representative Mikowitz's office, and Kathy Carangelo from City Council of Lamatina's office. Um, thank them for being here with us tonight. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Frank and uh, have him uh, start off the presentation. Thank you, John. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly and then turn this presentation over to people who are going to be talking about. But I want to kind of set the stage a little bit. I think many people recall uh, last December uh, we had an issue where one of the wall panels of the Callahan Tunnel fell into the roadway. Uh, MassDOT responded. We went out and we checked and we ended up removing that night or the next night another 27 panels. And then after looking at the condition of, of the tunnel over the next few days or weeks, we decided to remove all the wall panels because of the deteriorating condition of just the wall passing system. We had already been looking and planning on doing some rehabilitation work in the tunnel, but uh, upon closer inspection, we decided that the tunnel warranted a, a major renovation, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, we're going to do a significant amount of work in this tunnel. Our estimated value is in excess of $34 million. Uh, we've looked at a lot of alternatives of how to get this done as quickly as possible with as least disruption. And what we've come down to, and here's the big punchline for the night, um, we feel the best option for all of us is to uh, affect a uh, short duration closure of the tunnel to get the major work done in a short period. We can multi-shift it and get it done significantly. Our plan is to have essentially the tunnel closed uh, beginning on or about December 27th and closed for about three months. Um, we'll go through the details of the work of the work of the tunnel. Well then it'll the three month closure will then be the tunnel be reopened and we'll have a follow-on four to five months of night work and weekend work to finish up the finishes, put the wall panels back up. But we feel we can get the whole tunnel refurbished in a little bit over a total year um, and much less time than if we try to maintain one lane of traffic throughout it would go on for an ex an exceedingly much longer time. So we feel this is the best option for all of us, both DOT, the neighborhood, and the people who use the tunnel. So with that, uh, again, I want to thank you for coming out, and I'm going to turn it over to Neil Boudreau, who's going to give you the details of exactly what we're doing. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, 
So as Frank mentioned, he kind of touched on some of the issues we have in the tunnel. Um, we got a big picture of you in, up on the screen. Essentially, the deck that's out there is 1960s original concrete deck. Um, and you can only patch and, repa and repair and attend to it so many times before you have to pull the band-aid off and actually get out there and fix it and do it for, do it for real. Um, to try to buy us some time in December 2012, um, the district office milled and repaved to basically give us a, a surface to try to keep things intact throughout the winter, get us as far as we possibly can. Um, but we have to take care of that deck. Um, ready yet? Um, one of the other key things is uh, you can particularly see on the top uh, right hand side, the curb and gutter inlets are corroding, um, dangerously close to starting to cave in. Um, it is a deck, below it is a plenum, whereas if things start falling in, we have a big hole below. It's not like a roadway where you have a pothole. Um, and then finally, the uh, wall panels. Excuse me, that's recording. You just stop. Just um, like I said, the wall panels, they're all taken down. <clears throat> the brackets that are holding those up all have to be removed and replaced. Um, obviously, those are metal. And when you put metal against a concrete wall that has moisture and whatnot, so we're looking at using a different technology for repairing. Okay. So, what are the issues and the challenges with trying to re reconstruct uh, things in a tunnel? Um, obviously, the biggest thing is the overall width, 21 feet 3 inches, does not give us a lot of uh, room to work with. Um, let alone, it's actually kind of substandard for two lanes of travel. Um, Trying to do work in there at the same time as maintaining traffic is a challenge. The other big issue is the height, 13 feet 8 inches uh, of height. Wouldn't allow us to bring in a crane or other types of mechanism where we could put precast slabs and stuff in there um, without really delaying the project and creating a longer duration. Um, as I mentioned, the curb and gutter inlets are actually cast in place, um, so they're kind of tied in structurally to, to the uh, right above the deck. So again, it's a, it's a situation where we can't just go and order from a contractor a standard gutter or a curb line. These have to be custom made for this tunnel system. And finally, except like I mentioned the wall panels are unique to this tunnel system. Okay. Um, so what did we look at? We looked at, everyone asked us, well, can you keep one lane of traffic open? You know, in an ideal world, we'd love to do that. Um, except as we started to peel back the onion, so to speak, we found a lot of issues with, with doing that. Keeping one lane of traffic open, basically, keeping one lane open, yeah, you have an 11 foot travel lane, but all it leaves us after you put a barrier to protect the work zone, eight feet, three inches of work. That's barely enough for a pickup truck to get in there, let alone some type of heavy equipment. Sorry, I have to, can't stand in front of the speaker. Um, to get a pickup truck or any type of heavy equipment in there to actually work on the uh, on the, the deck. Try to move over here a bit better. So um, basically, that limits us. And the one thing, the key thing that I think is probably the most important reason why we would have an issue if we try to do one lane. That system, it's a tunnel. It's an enclosed structure. It has a fire suppression system. If we run traffic in there, we have to maintain the fire suppression system working, which means. The lane that is closed, the 11, 8 foot 3 inch lane, you have to, every about three, 300 feet I think they are, there's a standpipe which connects to water to put out a fire. You would have to basically box it out and extend it so if there was a fire, the fire department could actually get in there and take care of it. When we're doing the full closure, there's a little more flexibility because we have full control of what's going on in the system and we're not trying to protect the general public from traveling in and out. I think that's one of the key issues that we have with, with the option of one lane. The other problem with one lane is you can do one side and the other, you still have the middle part of the roadway. There's no way we can construct the middle part while we're doing just the one lane travel. So it still involves a full closure of the tunnel. Still is estimated by our construction because you have to do the whole length in the middle, a month and a half duration. Even if we try to accelerate that, we're still a significant impact on the public. Um, we felt that's why we started to look at other options. Um, one of the other things that came up, again, before we decided to go to the public, we sat down amongst ourselves and challenged each other. Is there a better way to do this? Can we look at this option? Can we look at that option? We don't want to close the tunnel if we don't have to. 
The reason we're doing it is because we feel it's the best option for the public. We looked at using one lane option, as I mentioned before, you would have to close one of the ramps that, go, that lead into the tunnel. You can't have the 93 access point and the surface access point both feeding into a one lane operation. There's just not enough width in that merge point right when you get into the mouth of the, the tunnel to get two, two vehicles in there safely. Yeah, you could do it by trying to do a one and one All that means is during the, when we have heavy traffic, you're going to have backups running all the way up into the 93 southbound tunnel and into the surface streets, creating gridlock on a daily basis. Something that we'd like to try to avoid. Um, so the other question is, 15, 15 years ago or so, we could have ran two-way traffic in the summer tunnel. It was easy. The access was via the surface streets. Everyone couldn't have got in there. You could have cut down off of 93. Um, however, with the new tunnel system, there's no I-93 southbound access to get anywhere close to that, that tunnel opening where you come out. We would have to reverse direction and essentially rebuild five intersections along the surface road to allow contraflow movements to allow surface, two-way traffic on surface road and then let people to get into the tunnel entrance. It's kind of a skewed angle. Um, what that means, rebuilding those five intersections, changing the traffic patterns, Gridlock in downtown Boston. It doesn't really work wonderfully today. During the peak hours, especially the PM peak, we tried to do this, we would basically cause chaos for as many months as we were out there. The other condition is, when you come out in South Boston, out of the summer, and we, now we have two-way traffic, how do we safely merge people back and deal with the toll booth facilities? Um, and finally, it poses a challenge to emergency vehicle. Um, you might say that the full closure is gonna pose that. We have a plan in place that we've set up, and I'll cover that in a little bit. But basically, how do we address um, emergency vehicle access? So, what is, what is the plan? We looked at the full closure, said we have three and a half months duration. The administrators pushed us. We're now going for three months, if not sooner. We, we, we have incel uh, accelerators into the contract to try to get this done quicker. Um, being realistic, we have the 3.5 month thing, just knowing that, you know, in the worst case, we want people to be prepared for, for the conditions. So they have to completely rebuild rehab and rebuild this deck and then put these curb and gutter inlets in. That'll be the first phase. That's that duration. The benefit of having the full tunnel for the contractor to work is he can work his way inside out. Um, he can kind of control the noise, the vibration, the dust from inside. We can close off using a curtain to keep the tunnel at temperatures that's convenient for pouring concrete, seeing as we are doing this work um, in the winter months. Um, and then the final work, as Frank had mentioned, that's 4.3 months putting up the wall panels. That is like traditional work that we do on a more frequent basis. We're out there 11 o'clock to 5 a.m. If it is an event at the garden or some other event in the city, we can push back the time and it's holidays, we, we don't work. That is stuff that you don't really see, you don't hear about, and we do it on a routine basis and it doesn't really bother the public. So we want to get in and get out into the concrete deck and the, and the, and the curb and gutter work. So in general, here's our, our matrix for the schedule. The total duration is 13.8 months. The big kicker is the full closure, 4.3 months of, of nighttime closure. And we don't have a, a period of time where we have the single lane closure. Um, and I think the benefit of that is, at the end of the day, it gives a consistent message to the public. Once we tell them this is the day we're going to start, it's closed, these are your detours, these are alternate routes, which we'll cover in a little bit. What the public is not sitting trying to guess is it open today? Is it closed? What time is it closed? Everyone in this room lived through the big day. You didn't know where, where you're going to be, on which road, which side of the road, which ramps are open, which exits. Every day was a different challenge. We're trying to be consistent here. It's closed. These are the routes you have to choose from. Um, as I mentioned, the contract will have incentive, disincentive clauses in there. Right now, we're looking at a two million, just over $2 million carrot. Um, spread that out over a four-week duration, trying to push that contractor to get the work done faster. It amounts to $71,500 a day. So every day he finishes early, he gets a bonus. Every day he's late, he gets penalized. So that's money that comes out of his profit margin. So it's, it's not like, you know, it's something that we're not going to give him as a, as a price. It comes out of his pocket versus if he finishes early, we give him a bonus. And one of the key things, which I'm sure is on everyone's mind here, is um, dealing with not the dust, the noise, and the vibration. Um, 
learning some of the things that we, we did going through the uh, Central Audi Tunnel Project. We need to have very good specifications in the, in the contract. We need to have requirements of the contract that have a mitigation plan if it does get too noisy. Set baseline thresholds. We've actually already been out taking readings um, to get baseline conditions. Uh, and really put the onus on the contract and we'll be on top of them to make sure that we're, we're not too noisy, too, you know, too loud and, and we're not causing vibration issues up there. Uh, with that, I'll turn over the traffic component to uh, Don Cook from BHP. Yep. Thank you. Um, so, just a couple of stats so you can have an understanding of what we're talking about here. So the tunnel today carries about 29,750 vehicles a day. Probably equally more important is sort of what happens every hour. So you have about 1,175 vehicles an hour in the AM rush hour and about 2,300 in the evening rush hour. So both of those are significant volumes, but as you can tell, the PM carries almost twice as much traffic in the tunnel as the AM. So as much as we're going to have to be careful and make sure we have plans in place that can cover and address the issues 24-7, we're paying particular attention to the evening rush hour. Now the other thing that we know from searching and looking at information is also understanding who's using the tunnel as to whether it's airport traffic or East Boston traffic. And that's important because as you can see, in the morning about 75% of the people are actually destined to the airport. In the afternoon it's 50%, which is less, but it's 50% of a higher number, so it's still quite a number of people. And it's important to know that because beyond the rush hours, with the airport activity, you still have high levels of activity on Thursday nights and on Sunday nights. So we just wanted to make sure that we were capturing and understanding who's using the tunnel today so we could better understand how we're going to manage that traffic when the tunnel is closed. So with that, um, this is a, a quick graphic that, that shows you who's using the tunnel today. Who of those 30,000 a day and of those peak hour volumes are using the tunnel today. So we really sort of have three <laughs> primary areas of folks that are using the tunnel. And the percentages vary a little bit by the time of day and by the area. But for the most part, it really works down to be about, about a third of the traffic that's using the tunnel is coming down I-93 from north of the city. About another third is coming from sort of the East Cambridge, you know, Back Bay area of the Astoro Drive that are coming down and accessing 93 South again and getting into the tunnel from the ramps from 93 South. And the last third, if you will, plus or minus, is using the surface access uh, right outside our doors here to be able to access into the tunnel directly. So it's really, again, it varies a little bit, but it's about a third and a third and a third. So with that, we did an analysis of then, okay, so if we shut the tunnel down, where, where are those people most likely to go? And we know that everybody, whenever we do any of these projects, sort of finds their own little special routes that they want to take. Um, but really, what we're also important is, is making sure that we, we sign the appropriate detour routes and we do the appropriate mitigation on the alternate routes to be able to manage this traffic. And so as you can imagine from the sort of a third, a third, and a third that I discussed, what we're seeing is about a third of that traffic that's coming from the north of the city is looking to try to get over to the airport north of the city. And the primary detour route that we're looking at is Route 16 um, that traverses from 93 through sort of Everett and Chelsea, connects over to 1A and down into East Boston into the airport. Again, that other third that's sort of the East Cambridge, Storo Drive, Back Bay area, um, what we're seeing is they'd like to try to do the Tobin Bridge outbound. And again, there's a number of ways, either it's a Chelsea Street or Meridian Street that you can get over. But we're not going to sign every, any of those as actual detour routes. We don't want to try to encourage traffic to go to, through too many neighborhoods. So we're still going to sign those folks to come up to 1 and 1A and come into, the, into East Boston the airport that way. And the last third, or even slightly more than that, because we captured a little bit more of the people in this area, want to try to get down and use the Ted Williams Tunnel. Um, and as, as Neil had said, um, the reality is, is if, we, if we only do a one-lane closure, I think it's important to note that it's not like 50% stay in the tunnel. That lane ends up being so narrow, and you've got barriers and construction activity, that actually only about 35% can get through the tunnel. So even with a partial closure, we're still displacing 65% of the people. And the other aspect is, is we're displacing them for a much longer period of time, on the order of a year plus. So we're trying to, trying to do the rip the band-aid off quick. We know it's not going to be easy uh, to be able to do that. 
The other aspect with the one lane that he had mentioned is that we can't have both the 93 access and the surface access going into one lane. So even with the one lane open, the downtown surface access is still traffic that's going to be displaced in detour. So just a couple of important points. So with that, we've identified a bunch of uh, detours. You can go to the next one, Mike. Um, so starting off from the downtown area, so I think MassDOT's really doing everything they can to try to accommodate this traffic. So uh, a couple of the ways from the downtown area would be either to detour down Albany Street. And if you go down Albany Street, there's a couple of U-turns. There's one at Traveler, there's one at Randolph Street. Uh, the one at Traveler, for example, is an HOV only access, but they're going to lift the restrictions on those HOVs, so even the general public can do that. But one of the primary detours would go a little bit further down 93 and get off at exit 18, which is the frontage road for those who know that area. And that's another area that they're really kind of pulling out all the punches here. That's an exit that you get off on the frontage road and then use what's called the bypass road or the hall road, which is restricted to general traffic now. They're going to lift that restriction. And the nice thing about that is that's a lovely, nice road that not a whole lot of people are driving on today. So that's going to give us a little bit of a nice relief valve to be able to get to the Ted Williams Tunnel through the, through the hall road. As I mentioned, instead of not only the HOV uh, access points in a few places, the access right off of Neyland Street that's HOV now will be lifted so that that's general traffic as well. And then, of course, looking at Storo Drive to the lever connector to be able to make that, that token bridge connection. The other thing that I think is worth mentioning is the reason, one of the major reasons why we're, we're fitting it in to January, December, late December, January to April is both because of airport activity, because obviously this is of importance to Massport and Airport, but also, as you know, for those who drive to Tobin today, there's a lane taken from April to November for bridge paint. And that's still going to be going on next year. So what we don't want to try to do is rely on the Tobin as one of our primary detour routes while that lane's gone. So in that window between December, January, and April, that lane's back. So that's a, a big plus to be able to use the Tobin as an alternate. And then sort of for more external areas to, 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 the, to the city, um, as I said, we're still talking about the exits of either 20 to Albany Street or 18 off of 93 southbound. Here's that first U-turn that's at Traveler Street. There's another one right about here. Here's the yellow that you would come down, cross over, and then this is the hall road. So that whole stretch, which you can't drive on today, will be a, an area that you'll be able to, drive <coughs> on to access the Ted Williams portal here. Dropping the HOV restrictions on a lot of the access points. Soldiers Field Road is an alternate because you can imagine that Ted Williams is one of our primary alternates. A lot of people want to try to get to the pike in one way, shape, or form. So we're going to be looking at Storrow as well to be able to make that connection to, to uh, I-90 eastbound to be able to get to the Ted. A lot of outreach, John's going to talk a little bit about a minute about with taxis and limos and Logan Express to make sure that, that, that we're doing the best that we can and we're keeping them in places that don't screw up general traffic as well being displaced. And the last thing, as I said, we're going to be using Route 16 to 1A for traffic for points in the north. Beyond that, outside, even further outside of the city, uh, if you drive around on 128 in those areas, you're selling the best routes to Logan signs. So they're all being reevaluated, replaced for this project, so there'll be a whole series of directional signage along 128 and as you approach from 93 and Route 1 and Route 3 and all those roads that direct you to one of these alternate routes that we've identified. I think that with that, I'll turn over to John and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about the outreach program. Thanks, Don. Um, so, bef a couple of things before I go into the actual public outreach that I wanted to touch upon, um, some which may have already been covered. But um, one of the other issues with the one lane uh, potential, which we've been asked about a lot, is that um, because of the size of the lane and the construction going on next to it, you, you, one would think you're going to get, well, you'll get 50% capacity through that lane that you do today. It's probably more on the lines of 35 to 40%. And if anybody in this room drives like I drive, all 100% of the people that want to use the tunnel think they're going to be one of the 35% that can use it. So you're going to have mayhem because everybody's going to try to be one of those people who can use the lane. So that's going to cause additional confusion and, and congestion. So. Um, because no one knows, you know, th there's no sign that goes up and says we're at 35%, you can't use it now. So um, that's one thing. The other thing I want to touch back on is with um, 
Neil talked a little bit about the consistency. Um, having lived through and worked through the big day right here in this community, as Neil said, on the biggest complaints we got is I never know what to expect when I come into town or when I try to get out of town. And that's really important and I think that's really key for, um, your, for our customers, which are you, which are the traveling public, is that there is a consistent message and you know exactly no matter what time of the day or what day of the week that you know what the detour plan is. If we were going to go use the other scenario, sometimes it'll be open at night, sometimes it'll be closed. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes it'll be closed on the weekends. If it was like 25 weekends, that it would be completely closed from Friday night to Monday morning. So you'd actually have to carry a scorecard around with you. So that a cheat sheet that so you would know in the town is that's not good. Um, to me, that's not good for the traveling public and our customers, which is you. Um, the pub public outreach, myself and Eliza, um, along with Neil and other members of the team, are going to um, continue the public outreach campaign. Um, this meeting is the beginning of it. <coughs> Excuse me. We've had a couple of legislative briefings already. Um, we met with the uh, with Senator Petroselli, Representative Mikeowitz, Representative Basil from East Boston, and City Council mm -hmm. Sal Amatina to brief them on this, so that they're well aware and they've made their concerns known to us. And we've assured them that we'll be working very closely with them and with the public to make sure that the information is out there. Um, we got an, uh, another one of these meetings next week on uh, Wednesday, the 26th, in East Boston. Uh, we're going to be reaching out to local, to Logan Express, regional bus companies. Um, when we did the Fast 14 in Medford, um, when we replaced the 14 bridges, um, we had this huge meeting at the convention center with all the like the limos and the taxi cabs and um, hotels and concierge, concierge people and things of that nature. And we briefed them so that they can get the word out to all of their uh, people and that worked very well. Um, we plan on doing something similar to that um, and we'll be meeting, we've been working cooperatively with Boston Transportation Department, which I know uh, Joe Flurry is here today from them, uh, Massport and uh, uh, DCR because we will be using some of their roadways as part of the detour. Um, we have a work, an internal working group that Neil is in charge of and we've been meeting with them so um, the out and the outreach will be ongoing between now and when we actually start the work and then throughout the whole time that we have um, the tunnel closed. Um, Administrator DePaulo did a press conference this morning around 11 o'clock. Um, I think it's been on every single news station, radio station. Um, a couple of the news stations are set up on the corner of North and Hanover Street so they can do their live broadcasts from there tonight. Um, I was joking with Frank, a month from now, no one will remember that we're doing this, but we'll do that again when we get right around the time we're going to close it, and it'll be all over the media again to help with the outreach. Um, we will have as, you know, bunches of small meetings with all of these type of groups so that they can get it out um, to their people. We're also going to have a dedicated web page um, that's in the process of being created, and that will have all the project information with all the project details. We are also creating a, design, uh, a specific and designated email address um, for FAST14. We did FAST14.com. We're probably going to do something like Callahan.tunnel, whatever, .com or something. Um, and Eliza will actually be monitoring that. We'll be able to get um, all, any complaints or concerns addressed right to a dedicated email address. Um, and I think that's uh, basically about it. Um, we know this is going to be very difficult. We're not trying to make it sound like this is going to be easy, but we feel that this is the absolute best way and the easiest way, and that trying to keep a lane open or doing any of the other things is actually will be more complicated, more confusing, and more of a problem for the public. So um, we will open it up to questions. Um, I do ask, um, our stenographer has uh, asked me to make sure that you, when you please stand up so that he can hear you and that you state your name and where you're from. So we'll have it for the public record. Um, and so I'm glad to take questions. And as I said earlier, for those who may have come in late, you know, we'll be around for a few minutes after the meeting if you have questions you want to come and ask us specifically. Um, and I also ask that you please sign in both in the black build book for the Nazaro Center and the sheets, the individual sheets for us. So sorry to make you do it twice, but those are the rules. Um, so, any questions? John, Phil Olandello, we're going to review. Um, I might have missed it. What's the access, access route for the North End traffic? 
They're going to to a Holden Bridge. Uh, Ted Williams Tunnel. How's the North End? I write for the North End. Yeah. Sure. So what, what are those rules? Well, I think it's it's both. I think um, depending on where you are and where you know you're here. Mm -hmm. um, but I think probably the best bet would be to jump on 93 South. And then you can either exit at Albany Street mm -hmm. and use one of those two U-turns to get directly back going towards the TED, or you can exit at 18, which is the frontage road, and then you'll be on the Hall Road and you end up at the Porter right back there in South Boston. Or the, or the Tobin Bridge. Or the Tobin Bridge. North Washington. North Washington Street as well to get to the building. One of the key things we're going to do is we're going to prepare like eight and a half by 11 detour sheets, you know, detours, like we did for the Fast 14. So you can go on our web page and say, oh, I need to know where to go. So you have something you can take with you, and if one day it's messed on itself, you go to North Washington. And so it gives you the options. Rather than just try to follow the signs, we want people to have that material. Anybody else? What's the cost? It's probably 34 point nine million. 34.9 million. Yeah. Other questions? Anybody? Um, uh, Victor Brown in North End. Just a couple of construction questions, just out of curiosity. You're replacing wall panels, uh, not ceiling panels. I assume that uh, a survey has been made and that they have been determined to be sound. Right. No? Well, yeah, they, yeah. Well, the ceiling panels, uh, they're not included as part of the work. Uh, there is one element. Uh, that will address ceiling and that will be some testing of the existing ceiling anchors. The ceiling system was installed in the early 90s. It's still serviceable and it will be maintained into the future. And I also note that there's no uh, structural work being done, no waterproofing and so forth. I assume the survey has been made and that those have been determined to be sent out. Oh, in terms of the entire yes. work of the tunnel, yeah. uh, there are, let's say, minor leaks in, in the tunnel. I call tunnels leak a little bit, but uh, uh, this work is concentrated on the roadway. There'll be some patching in the supply plenum down below where there's some concrete deterioration. But in terms of the entire ring of the tunnel, this is a tunnel through rock. Uh, there's, there'll be a few leak repairs done to the walls where there is some very minor leakage right now. Uh, th that leakage was primarily the cause of some of the deterioration of uh, the support materials for the existing wall system. Well, I guess what sort of got me thinking about it was you're doing the deck first, which means that you can't do anything under what's under the deck um, at all, because that would, would obstruct access to what's underneath. Um, well, what's, what's below the deck is actually the, the supply air plenum. That's a complete open space underneath there. And there will be uh, localized uh, concrete repairs. There are you know, areas of deterioration that will be patched. Uh, that work can go on independent of the traffic because those areas are accessible underneath. Um, so that work will be done. The deck work is, is a partial depth deck reconstruction. Um, the deck is actually 15 inches thick. The repairs to it involve all the wearing surface, which is asphalt, plus three to four inches of the top concrete, which is the period. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, thanks. Anybody else? Any other questions? Jared Wynn, I actually live in East Boston, and my question, Jared. Um, so my question, you guys seem to have been really good about getting the road traffic. And I've seen a couple pushes towards take public transportation to the airport, which is a great idea, right? We have this great transportation system, we might as well use it. But for people who actually live in East Boston, so you're adding more traffic to theoretically the blue line, which is already full during rush hour, constantly. Like I'm constantly standing at State Street waiting for five trains to come by before I can actually get on. And then, I don't know about the silver line because I don't take it. Um, but then, we also have this issue where you've got a lot of, I don't want to say poor people living in East Boston, but people who don't make a lot of money and who are living and working in service jobs where they're in the city until 2 o'clock in the morning, and now the tea doesn't run, and it's already a problem to try and get a cab to take me to East Boston from downtown Boston at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
I'm waiting for five, six caps before somebody will actually be willing to take me to East Boston. So now I can finally get a cab, and now we're adding another 10, 15, 20 dollars onto the fare because now I've got to either go through around through Chelsea or down to the Ted Williams tunnel, and I'm not making a lot of money in order to add this extra five, ten dollars for five nights a week for nine months. Uh, what's our plan there? So, so the idea is for us to do this as quick and as fast as possible so that we can eliminate as much of the inconveniences for everybody um, as we can. And this is the quickest, fastest way. And if we, even if we used the other, you know, if we were able to go with the other way, it would be closed every night. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't change that for you whether we closed it at night or not. So, I mean, whether we did it with the one lane or the full closure. So this allows us to do it the absolute fastest way and get you back to normal as quick as humanly possible. Right. And, and I'm not I'm not disputing that. I'm not I'm not saying that there's a quicker way to do it. Mm -hmm. My question is, what is our plan for either adding more capacity to the blue line, yeah. like making it, adding another train, or even extending it? Like yeah. I know everybody's talked about extending the T after hours and whatnot, but like, or even like there's no accountability for cabs either. Like cabs are just like oh, I'm not going to take you to the airport. Like I'm not going to take you to East Boston. And there's nothing we can. We're just kind of stuck. Like. You, you bring up something, uh, a, a concern that we certainly now are aware of, um, that there's a desire or a need to have some kind of public transit after the mainline MBK shuts down. I think what the best, the best way to answer that is we'll start through some method of public outreach to see how much demand there is for that. Um, the silver line is very flexible as far as you know when it runs and, and how long it runs. So I think if we if we see that there's a need for extended service, my initial reaction would be we can work with the T to extend the hours of operation of the Silver Line, which would provide that access over uh, from South Station through that dedicated tunnel and through the Ted Williams, which is always open, over to East Boston and that area. So we can look into that. I, I do have to say that we have to figure out whether it's a whether there's a a significant number of people who need that or, or how limited that is. But if it, it's a good concern, it's something we haven't really heard before, then we'll take that under advisement. But somebody will be looking into that and we'll, we'll come back with some kind of public response of, of addressing that need after the two, uh, after the 1 a.m. show. Um, what about potentially during like rush hour traffic and the blue line being at capacity already? Add, is there some way to add capacity there? Well, one of the things they are looking at, you know, the T I know is looking at is see if they can increase the level of service on the silver line. Um, as they're doing work, they're going to maintain the blue line at, at full capacity throughout. Um, I realize that some of the transit lines are getting to the point where there are so many passengers that their ability to take more is, is limited. That's why the T is looking at maybe at least extending or increasing the silver line service during this period. Thank you. Are there, Maria? Just two quick questions. One being. Maria, you, can you just state uh, your name? Oh, I'm sorry. Maria, I work for State Representative Aaron Michaelitz. Um, and my questions are first off, is does the permit allow them to be able to work day and night? in the tunnel? And if so, regardless of that actually, have the issues of noise and vibration been taken into account for residents who live, of course, above? Yes, so the project is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that we take full advantage of the closure. Um, the second thing is there was a slide up earlier that Nail covered about noise and dust and vibration, and we are actually using a similar specification like we did on the big on the big dig for noise and we've already had um, our noise our environmental people go out and take readings in several areas around the portal in the north end and in east boston to get a baseline background noise reading and then what well, the specification will allow them to work us to make noise a certain level above that which is what we did with the big dig and then if they were to exceed that then we have the ability to shut them down and stop them from doing that work um, they will also have to submit a work plan to us, to our environmental people, 
to show how they're not going to exceed those levels, and if they are, what their mitigation is to get them under those levels. So it's not just sitting back and waiting for them to go over the levels and shut them down. It's they have to submit a plan up front for our environmental <laughs> people to review and accept that plan, and then, that'll, and then they'll be allowed to work. It also gives us the bite on the end that should, even with all that said, if they do go above that, that we can then stop them from working and require them to either find a different way to do it or to do it during the daytime. But the object is 24-7 during those three months to get the full um, benefit of the tunnel closure. Um, for a good piece of the tunnel, we're, in, we're, we're under the water in the middle there, so the concern as we get closer to both portals um, is obviously there, and that's why that's another benefit of the full tunnel because if we need if they need to put noise curtains or anything like that, they can't because they don't have to maintain any traffic, just their own work people. So that that helps us. That's a benefit for us for for noise and dust control as well. Anybody have anything else? If not, thank you all very much for coming. We really appreciate it. And as I said, we'll be here for a while. Um, if anybody has any other questions they want to ask us offline. Thank you all very much for coming. We really appreciate it.